Thank you, children. Let's pray. Father, we have come here because we want to hear you. Father, we have heard you through singing. We've heard you through prayer. And I know that your Holy Spirit is speaking to each person who is listening right now. So we ask that you continue this conversation and that you speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. When Jesus was teaching parables, he taught in parables for several reasons. Uh, sometimes it was actually to make his meaning more obscure to those who weren't interested in following him anyway. And to others, it was to make his meaning more clear to those who were interested. There's a little excerpt I have here I want to read from uh, Christ Object Lessons talking about Jesus speaking in parables. It says, in parables, he rebuked the hypocrisy and wicked works of those who occupied high positions and in figurative language clothed truth of so cutting a character that had it been spoken in direct denunciation, they would not have listened to his words and would speedily have put an end to his ministry. But while he evaded the spies, he made truth so clear that error was manifested and the honest in heart were profited by his lessons. There are so many different interpretations of Scripture. It is hard to imagine how one book could have so many different contradictory teachings. There is, there is one Bible, but yet there are thousands of Christian denominations. And they all say that this is the book they follow and believe in, that this book is their highest authority. But yet, so many different viewpoints. How is that possible? The words were written a long time ago, right? They're not changing moment by moment. And yet, we have all of these different interpretations. How does it happen? One Christian says, for instance, that the Sabbath was done away with at the cross, according to the Bible, they say. And others say, no, the Sabbath is still to be kept by Christians also, according to the Bible. Some say women and men should both be the head, according to the Bible. Others say no, the man should be the head, according to the Bible. As usual, Scripture tells us how to interpret it, doesn't it? Jesus gave, I think, the greatest key to interpretation of the Scriptures in one statement that can be found anywhere else in the Bible. I think he sums it up beautifully, and he gives us the key so that we can know if our interpretation will be correct. Because we all must interpret the Bible, right? That's what we do. That's what God has asked us to do. So let's go to the verse that was already read, and let's read it as Jesus tells us how to know what the true meaning of Scripture is. John 7:17 7, says, if anyone wills to do his will, in other words, if you want to do what God says, 
Now, before we go any farther, we need to, we need to set this up. When I, when I was in seminary, my favorite professor, who was dean of the seminary, his name is Gerhard, was Gerhard Hazel. And Gerhard Hazel had scholarly books about Bible interpretation that were published, used widely throughout the denomination, but used widely also throughout the world in many different denominations. He probably achieved a, a level of scholarship, either him or Siegfried Horn, unlike anything any Adventist ever has or probably ever will achieve outside of the Adventist church. But anyway, Dr. Hosel used to tell us, if you really want to know how to interpret the Bible, the key is something called presuppositions. In other words, what people already believe before they come to the Scripture. Now, no one is a blank slate. All of us have an opinion before we come to the Scripture, right? You would be brain dead if you didn't have an opinion. And he was telling us your presuppositions, what you think and believe before you come to Scripture, is more important even than the Scripture itself because if your presupposition is wrong, your Bible interpretation will be wrong. Just to give you one example of this, there are many that do not believe that the supernatural ever happened in the Bible. They, they don't believe that's possible. So they come to Scripture and they say, there is no supernatural, there is only science and natural law, and that's all there is. So they will say things like, when Jesus walked on water, what actually happened there, I hate to say this because it, it, it's so, uh, anyway, when Jesus walked on water, what actually happened, it's, it's kind of demonic actually, that's why I don't like to say it. When Jesus walked on water, what actually happened there was, it wasn't a miracle at all. Actually, it was cold and the water was frozen. And that didn't happen very often in that part of the world. So therefore, they were so astounded by it that they thought it was a miracle. But of course, we know today that that didn't happen. I was actually told that in a religion class in college by the head of the religion department. Actually, the whole class was told that. Because his presupposition is what? There is no supernatural. So you see, in some ways, it almost, <laughs> it almost doesn't matter what Scripture says if your presupposition is wrong. Now, Jesus did not use the word presupposition, obviously, but... Uh, he says it the same way. He says in John 7:17, 7, if anyone wants to do his will or wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority. In other words, if you want to follow God, no matter what he says, if you want to please God, you will know if the scripture is correct just as we just read from Christ's Object Lessons, the honest of heart. In other words, if you don't really want to do God's will, you won't be able to rightly interpret the Scripture. You won't be able to rightly interpret the Bible. It's our fallen nature and our rebellious heart that keeps us from getting the proper understanding of the Bible. It's not about intellect or education, as so many believe, or even maturity, but it's about our rebellious heart, our fallen nature, and us really, in some instances, not wanting to do God's will. And so when we come to a scripture we don't like the way it reads. We say something like, well, it doesn't really mean that. This is what it really means. Have you ever heard people do that? <laughs> have, have you ever done that? 
We think of legal contracts, legal documents. We pay people sometimes. We pay attorneys sometimes to look for loopholes, right, in the documents. Find the loophole. Find a way that I do not have to honor this contract the way they say or think I should. I am paying you to find the loophole. If you are looking for the loopholes in Scripture, you'll almost always find it. I've told this story before, but it, it, it fits here so well. Uh, we had a church member a few years ago, and, and she had a friend that she had grown up with. And the friend had grown up a Seventh-day Adventist and was active in the church as a young person. But then as they, as they got to adulthood, they saw things a little differently, and this woman ended up leaving the church. And not only did she leave the church, but she wrote and spoke um, very aggressively as she traveled around the country to try and get people to stop being Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, she had all the reasons. So this church member said, I want to bring my friend in. She's visiting from out of town, and I'd like her to talk to you. So I said, okay. So um, we sat there in my office, and um, we started talking about the Sabbath. And she said, well, of course, uh, the Bible is clear the Sabbath was, is not to be kept anymore because we are not under law, we are under grace. And I was kind of shocked to hear her say that, but of course, we've all heard that uh, multiple times. And I said, well, um, what about the fact, and she said, besides that, the Sabbath is a Jewish thing, and we're not Jews, and the Sabbath was just temporary, and it was just given to the Jews, and, and so we don't need to keep that. And, and uh I knew she knew this, but I said, well, what about Genesis 2, where it says God rested on the seventh day, and he blessed it, and he sanctified it. And then she said something I've never heard anybody say in response to that verse. She said, well, that doesn't prove anything. It doesn't say anything about worship. And I, was, I said, what? You know. I was, I was shocked. See, her presupposition is, I'm going to get away from this Sabbath thing. I don't want to be a Seventh-day Adventist anymore. So it doesn't matter what it says. It's not going to f fit into my, what I want to do. So she looked for a loophole, and she's right. It doesn't say in Genesis 2, you must worship on the seventh day of the week. Those words are not there, but it's obviously clear, isn't it, what God intended. All right, that's an example of how people and their presuppositions or what they already believe ahead of time will affect how they interpret Scripture. But what about those of us who accept the Sabbath? Does that mean that we are correct with that we have the correct interpretation on every other scripture. Well, we would hope so, wouldn't we? Now I'm going to read <laughs> I'm going to read three scriptures. I'm not going to comment on them. And um, these are these are what we would say in today's language hot button scriptures or issues. And even within the church, we have different interpretations of what they mean. In fact, I am certain even among us here, we will have different interpretations about what these mean. All because, going back to, do you want to do his will? All right, first one is 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. 
Remember, we're talking about honesty of heart. First Corinthians 11, 3, but I want you to know that, Christ, that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Here's another scripture, 1 Corinthians 6 and 9 and 10. Paul says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And now let's go to one more. Romans 13, 1 and 2. Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. In our church, in our church, there are some who challenge these scriptures and tell us they do not really mean what they say, right? Do you want to do God's will or are you looking for the loopholes? The scriptures are spiritual and we are by nature carnal. That means sometimes they are going to cut, maybe a lot of times, but hopefully not for the born-again Christian, but sometimes they are going to cut across the grain. They're not going to fit with society. If we, if we adapt what the Scripture is saying there, it will cause us possibly problems within our own spirit, maybe within our own family, maybe within our own community. We won't be like everybody else. We naturally reject any scripture that seeks to crucify our carnal nature. But we need to ask the question, do you struggle with scripture ever? If you say, I believe, if you say you never struggle with scripture, either you are perfect or you are not being honest of heart. In the Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program, the first and most important step, which you must accept if you are going to go on to the next step, otherwise none of the other steps mean anything, the first step is the step that it, you admit you are wrong and are powerless by yourself to overcome your bad habit. With, as I said, without that first step, nothing will work to change you. I want to give a, a little testimony about myself. When I first came to Christ and accepted all of the new changes and things in my life, I was so happy. I was, I was at peace. Temptations, instead of being large and strong, had shrunk down to a little mini size, and I could look at the temptations and just kind of go, huh, and move on without much of a struggle at all. My worries seemed to have vanished away when I first came to Christ, and I, and I wanted so much to do His will, and I, I made the life changes, and I was happy, and I was, I was growing, and everything was right with the world. I remember getting up every morning, and instead of 
do, I was in college at the time, and instead of doing my college work uh, like I thought I needed to, it was, it was reading the Scriptures. It was reading the spirit of prophecy. I could not get enough of it. Sometimes I would skip meals because I wanted to read more. You see, I had to make up for all that I didn't know all my life and all that I hadn't heard before, and I devoured it. I was like a starving man, and these things were my food. It was wonderful. But then, time passed, and... um, I realized that I could not just continue on that past experience and expect to be the same with the Lord. He was asking me to do other things, make other commitments to Him, to change this or that attitude about something. And I realized eventually that I couldn't keep saying, well, I already did that in the past, and Of course, he would say something like, yes, I'm aware of that, but you're farther down the road now. You're not the same person. I'm I'm calling you to a, a deeper commitment with me. And even though I wanted to do it so much at the beginning, I found time over the years, as I'm sure you have, that some of these things I was not so willing to do. And I would get stuck. My honesty of heart was not always what it should be. My heart to obey hasn't always been there. But I'm learning it's the only way. Notice what it says in Psalm 73. And we could could choose many scriptures that say the same thing. Psalm 73 and verse 1. It says, truly God is good to Israel to such as are pure in heart. Jesus talked about this in his Sermon on the Mount, didn't he? He talked about how important it was. And if we, if we go there to the Sermon on the Mount and read a few of those, we see the same thing. Matthew 5, starting in verse 3. Jesus says there, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And then here it is, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Are you and I pure or honest of heart? with God? Do you want to do His will? And of course you want to do some things in His will, maybe many things in His will you want to do. But how about when it cuts across your natural inclinations? Your fear of going against the crowd and and being ridiculed. Your pride or your ungodly lust. We need deeper devotion. We need to be wanting to do His will. We need to be more honest of heart. Jesus pleads with us. He longs for us to want to do his will. If someone doesn't want to do his will, you can talk to them till you're blue in the face. Jesus himself could show up and with blazing letters show them the scripture. It wouldn't make any difference. The greatest preacher or teacher 
the greatest prayer can pray for that person. But if they don't want to do his will, it doesn't matter. That has to be first. Jesus pleads with us. He longs for us to want to do his will. He knows how hard it can be. After all, even though he is fully divine, he is also fully human, isn't he? Hebrews 5 talks about the struggle that Jesus had. Now, I don't want to get off on this because it's another subject. Jesus was not struggling with sin, but he struggled with his Father's will sometimes. Notice what it says in Hebrews 5, verse 7, talking about how Jesus understands how it's hard for us to want to do God's will sometimes because he also struggled with that at times. Who in the days of his flesh, it says, Hebrews 5, 7, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. My friends, he can make you like him because of what he went through. He became perfected through this process. Notice what the next verse says. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. You say, if I'm, if I'm really being honest, I'm not always honest of heart towards God and his will. Sometimes I don't want to do it. Sometimes I close the Bible. Sometimes I let my mind go in another direction. Sometimes I hear the Holy Spirit speaking to me and I say, not now, Lord. Or maybe we pretend not to hear. You know how sometimes when uh, somebody's trying to get your attention and uh, you don't want to talk to them and... uh, You absolutely hate doing this one task. Maybe it's it's pulling weeds in uh, one of your flower beds, but all of a sudden, you're very interested in pulling weeds in your flower bed because this person is trying to get your attention and you don't want to talk. Oh, uh, mm, I'm busy. I'm I'm pulling the weed. I'm doing something. I, I think we're like that with God sometimes. We're not honest of heart. You and I are not, if we're honest, are not always honest of heart with God. But Jesus is. Jesus figured it out. And he will give us that heart of his that he developed, that he perfected in this life as a man. He will give us that honesty of heart if we let him. So you see, we have to have his heart to want to do his will, to interpret the scriptures correctly, and to fully become his son's and his daughters. But like the Alcoholics Anonymous, we first have to admit, I'm not always honest of heart. I can look at our Christian friends, our brothers and sisters who don't keep the Sabbath or who believe other things that that we would say would be unscriptural, but what is it about our life that we're being unscriptural? That we're coming up with interpretations that man alive, they get so twisted and confusing that uh, they're tiring to listen to, and we don't even believe them. 
even though we're saying them. <laughs> and um, it was interesting, the scripture read in the children's story, the Lord doesn't look at the outward appearance, but he looks what? At the heart. We can't do that. But he can. Maybe, maybe the best we can say is, Lord, I want to be honest of heart. Help me to be honest of heart. Give me the heart of Jesus. Because without it, all the scripture and the prayer and the agonizing in the world will mean nothing. If I've already made up my mind, I'm not going to do what you say. Father, help us to be honest of heart like Jesus was honest of heart. Amen. Our closing song is 319. Father, we know this is heart work. It's a battle in the heart. We fight it probably to one degree or another every day. But sometimes we don't fight it. We go our way. We do it our way. We think it our way. And we tell ourselves that it's okay because the scripture could say this or could mean that. Father, help us to learn through the power of your Son to be honest of heart. May he give us his heart. May you give us your heart. Help us, Father, this is our only hope. We thank you and praise you.
in Jesus' name. Amen.